Canterbury is Britain's holiest city, the seat of the Archbishop, a mecca for pilgrims over the centuries and visited by the likes of Charles Dickens who frequented these streets. In this video, we'll show you some of the beautiful historic places, streets and buildings that you can explore during a visit to this cathedral city. Passing through the Westgate fortifications, which we'll tell you more about later, we'll start in the historic High Street, pedestrianised between 10.30 and 4pm daily. The city was founded by the Romans 2,000 years ago. Much of what we see today is from the medieval era. Just like the ancient capital of England, Winchester, that we covered in a previous video, you need to look above the street level to really see the past. This building was originally a late 16th century three-storey jettied building. Current facade was not added until the 17th century and the dormer windows in the 18th century. On the north side of the high street is Mercery Lane. The houses here still have the projecting upper storeys and the 14th century wood beams. The Tudor Revival Beanie Institute building was designed by architect A. H. Campbell in 1897 and opened on the 11th of September 1899 to house the Canterbury Museum and Public Library that had originated on Guildhall Street. Free to enter, it also holds the Tourist Information Office, an art gallery and free to use toilets. On the corner of Best Lane and the High Street is a statue of Geoffrey Chaucer, dressed as a pilgrim. He was the famous Middle Ages poet and author of the Canterbury Tales. The 30 characters from the book are depicted on the plinth below him. Almost opposite the statue is East Bridge Hospital. Not a hospital as we use that word today, but a place of hospitality for weary pilgrims travelling to Canterbury Cathedral. Open since the 12th century, for the last 400 years it's been an almshouse and still houses some elderly people. One of the most photographed buildings in Canterbury, the old Weaver's House, is a lovely half-timbered building on the River Star. The river runs right past the building and under the High Street. The house takes its name from the influx of Flemish weavers who settled in the area having fled religious persecution. Elizabeth I granted them the right to establish their businesses in Canterbury. Believed to date back to the 14th century, even though the sign says 1500, most of the current building is from a reconstruction in the 16th century. At the rear of the house is a medieval ducking stool, jutting out over the river, you can just see it there in the distance. This ducking stool was historically used as a method of punishing people, and it may well have included witches. Dunked under the water and held for several minutes, if she didn't drown she was proved a witch. If she drowned, well, never mind, her name was cleared. Canterbury's historic River Tour Company offers regular punts along the river, leaving from the back of the weaver's house. Moving to a side street, we walk the Friars, passing the Pilgrim Hotel and a collection of period properties that are opposite the Marlowe Theatre. Named after Christopher Marlowe, a famous Elizabethan playwright born in Canterbury and who attended King's School here in the city. The Canterbury Tales pub is just named such and has nothing to do with the author or the tales. This brings us back to a river crossing catching glimpses of the cathedral This delightful area is home to a sculpture by Rick Kirby called The Bulkhead, although his own website names it Mask. Behind it is the 1315 Beerlings Hall, 
previously a guest house for pilgrims. Take a moment on the bridge to enjoy the scenery, maybe see some of the visitors experiencing a punt on the River Stour, hearing tales of the past from their guide. So far we have explored the green area, the high street and round the river on the Friars. Now we'll move into the red area, part of what's known as the King's Mile. Henry II fell out with and murdered the Archbishop Thomas Becket, now a saint, in the cathedral back in 1170. It's the reason why pilgrims flock here to pay respects at his shrine. Four years later, a remorseful Henry walked barefoot in the streets of Canterbury in a cloth sack to be flogged by the monks on the order of the Pope, hence it became known as the King's Mile. Less busy but no less interesting with all the period houses. We are now approaching a very strange house come bookshop. About to tumble down at any minute is the crooked house perched on the end of Palace Street. It grabbed the attention of Charles Dickens when he visited Canterbury to give a public reading. It's claimed it may have inspired a passage from David Copperfield. Have no fear, a hidden metal frame now holds the property in place so it can't lean any further. It's probably best photographed when the door is closed, really showing off the lean. In front of us is the entrance of King's School inside the cathedral grounds. Dating from 597 AD, it's reported to be the oldest school in the world. Continuing our walk along the borough within the King's Mile are the outer walls of the school on the right side and an eclectic mix of shops on the left. antiques and this oboe shop, not something you see every day. Coming back down onto Palace Street, we pass what is believed to have been the gatehouse to the Archbishop's Palace. The building opposite is Conquest House. On the 29th of December 1170, four knights met at a house near Canterbury Cathedral to plan the murder of Thomas Becket. The place where the knights met is reputed to be this house. We approach the Bell and Crown Public House, licensed since 1862 the name being chosen to commemorate the marriage of Prince Alice, Queen Victoria's second daughter, to Prince Louis, Grand Duke of Hesse. A fine example of half-timbered buildings is at 8 Palace Street, a 13th century building constructed with two projecting upper stories over a ground floor, each upper story projecting further than the last. The upper floors may well be 15th century.
back in the throng of the city, there is much to see at the point four streets meet. Palace Street, Orange Street, Guildhall Street and Sun Street. We'll be heading along Sun Street because there is a rather interesting hotel to show you. The Sun Hotel, dating back to 1480 despite the 1503 plaque, was once called the Little Inn and made famous by Charles Dickens in David Copperfield. Dickens stayed here amongst other places during his visits to Canterbury. A great fire in 1865 damaged timber buildings in the surrounding streets but luckily this one was virtually untouched. We arrive at the well-known butter market outside the cathedral by the Christchurch gate where you enter the cathedral if visiting. Sadly it was completely covered in scaffolding. We won't be visiting the cathedral in this video as due to Covid we couldn't get one of the limited tickets but we'll put a link top right once we've been back. Up until the 17th century the butter market was known as the bull steak a place to tether bulls overnight to be baited by dogs, believing it would produce more tender meat. There are some incredibly old buildings and public houses in this area. This shopping thoroughfare is Burgate, leading us to the city outer walls and where one of the eight gates to access the fortified city used to be. At various points you get glimpses of the cathedral, but frustratingly it's hidden away from full view unless you have a ticket to enter the inner cathedral grounds. Burgate, meaning Gate of the Borough, is actually one of only two street names in Canterbury that are over a thousand years old. The other is Old Ruttington Lane. Look out for the Moat Tea Room, a tiny timber building with delightful looking cakes in the window. Reaching the noisy main road, the gate has gone but the city walls remain, part of which date from Roman times. Crossing the road we see a lone gatehouse in the distance. We'll head up Church Street to explore this important area just outside the city walls. This area holds the ruin of St Augustine's Abbey, founded in 598 AD after St Augustine arrived in Kent on a mission to convert the pagan Anglo-Saxons to Christianity. The work he began succeeded, converting the whole of England within a hundred years. The abbey thrived and was dedicated to St Augustine in 978. It was one of the most important monasteries in medieval England. For almost 1000 years it was a centre of learning and spirituality, until Henry VIII had it torn down in the suppression of monasteries. What we see today is all that remains. You can tour inside when open, maintained by English heritage. For more on St Augustine, take a 15 minute walk behind the abbey ruins to St Martin's Church. It was here having arrived from Rome, he set up his mission in 597 AD which makes the church the oldest in England. A garden close to the entrance of the abbey holds the statues of Queen Bertha and King Ethelbert. On the throne at the time Pope Gregory I sent Augustine to England. Queen Bertha is mentioned in nearly all retellings of St Augustine's mission, having believed the Christian faith and thus swayed the pagan king to Christianity.
Heading back down the high street as the grey clouds cleared, we arrive at the West Gate, the only one of eight still surviving. It's actually the largest city gate still standing in England, built in 1380 to protect Canterbury during the Hundred Years' War. Inside is a museum telling the story of the structure and how it ended up being the city jail until the early 20th century. The views of the city from the top are supposed to be wonderful. Sadly, it was closed due to COVID on our day. Take a walk along the banks of the River Stour through the Westgate Gardens for some lovely scenery. This could also be a great place to have a picnic during your visit. Just 50 minutes from London by train, regular direct services from St Pancras Station drop you at Canterbury West, a few minutes walk from the city gates. By car there are three park and ride locations bringing you into the city from £4 a day. Or grab a coach from the London terminals, prices from £15. This was just a taste of what you can see in Canterbury in a day. For more ideas, please do check out this website. If you like this video, then you may well like our Ancient Capital of England video on Winchester for another great day out easily reached from London by train. If you enjoyed the tour, then do give us a like, make a comment or even subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching and we'll see you again soon.